we are about to get started at any rate. And um, as Maureen said, if you have questions, uh, go ahead and, and go through her, and we will have a question and answer period at the end of the presentation. So uh, starting out, um, this is a, a slide that uh, I've, I've kind of added to most of the presentations uh, that I do. I, I kind of love Albert Einstein quote. I think he had uh, hundreds of them that, that apply uh, still today. And uh, one of my favorites is that he fears the day that technology will surpass our human interaction and the world will have a generation of idiots. And I hope that that's not our generation. Um, as you can see with the, the photo here with the cell phones, three people sitting at the table, none of them talking to each other, but uh, all communicating with somebody other than the people that they're in the room with. It basically, what the reminder is there is just, you know, uh, put the technology away and enjoy for, uh, you know, 45 or 50 minutes here of the presentation, and hopefully you can learn something and pick up a few tips. And if you have any questions, again, just uh, feel free to jump right in there. Um, and in the meantime, uh, I think Maureen tells people this, put yourself on mute. I don't hear any background noise, so today we have an exceptional audience, I think, uh, because lots of times we do have stuff going on in the background. <clears throat> All right, the key with uh, um, learning and uh, applying and improving reliability is uh, uh, use that technology where it's appropriate, you know, and build a business case for the technology. Um, and use it to improve things or make things more efficient. And uh, some of us would argue, gee, the cell phone and the smartphone has, has really made us a heck of a lot more efficient than we used to. There's others that would say that, uh, no, it's really made us more distracted and therefore less efficient. Um, it all depends on, on what we're using those things for. Uh, what we do need to do is to continue to improve and innovate technology and um, it's really, it still comes down to the human brain as the best piece of technology and the most powerful technology that we have available to us. And uh, we should be using that in, in every way we can to communicate with others and, and help us improve things on a day-to-day -day basis. <clears throat> so if you would, make sure your screen is silent. Uh, and for the next 45 or 50 minutes, ignore the emails and the text messages because you might miss something where all of a sudden so what's tough about the webinars is, you know, you can't raise your hand and say, gee, Doug, could you repeat that for me um, if all of a sudden you decide to answer a text message. So uh, <clears throat> also remember good things come to those who wait. So if you put it aside for, for uh, 45 minutes, which I just did mine, by the way, and uh, we'll get started here. First things first, when it comes to reliability, and by the way, I, you know, I've been in this business uh, on the consulting side now about 15 years. It seems hard to believe that it's been that long, but uh, um, being on this side of the fence and uh, doing a lot with RCM and predictive technologies and helping companies organize their reliability programs, build hierarchies, do uh, uh, criticality analysis of their equipment. Um, lots of these things are pretty large undertakings and getting involved with technologies, people consider that a large undertaking as well. And one of the things that I tell my clients right off the get-go is forget about excuses. What you really need up front is a plan. Um, excuses don't accomplish anything. And, and, and I hear them all, by the way, you know, we don't have, our boss doesn't support us. Uh, well, guess what? Welcome to the club, all right? We all have bosses that, that sometimes don't understand the things that we're getting into and that we're trying to do to advance ourselves. Um, uh, you have to show that business case. That's your responsibility as, as a maintenance person. And that's one of the things that changed my career is when I finally had a boss that said, you know, the, when somebody tells you no, that doesn't mean that uh, that was the final answer. It just means your business case wasn't good enough. Right? So if you think the idea still has merit, you just need to build a better business case. So <clears throat> always think about that, that uh, when it comes to implementing and doing things like uh, putting an ultrasound program in, if you have a manager that tells you no, it's typically the only reason you were told no is the business case wasn't good enough. Well, I also hear the excuse, we're so far behind, what's the point? Well, if we never get started, uh, you're never going to get there. So. Uh, if you're interested in the technology, it's not about where you are, it's where you're going. 
Um, the operations group doesn't get it. Uh, that That's going to be true as well. And the reason why lots of times they don't get things is we don't include them in the conversation. All right, and you have to make sure they're a part of it to say, gee, I see people out walking around with these fancy instruments out on the floor. What are they, what are they doing? Right? Um, all you need to do is engage them in that conversation. Here's, uh, here's our new technology. Here's what we're doing with it. You know, whether we're out finding air leaks or what we're, whether we're in a, a electric room or a motor control room listening for arcing or corona, uh, show them what you're doing. Right? <clears throat> And then the last excuse I hear quite a bit is, well, we don't have the tools or the training to start. And in today's world, that's one of the biggest excuses that I look at people and go, come on, really? Because you can simply go on and Google and, and find all kinds of information and training on uh, whatever it is that you're interested in, and it's free. Right? It really comes down to how motivated you are to getting things done. All right. Also, I tell people it's, it's also time to face reality. Um, today's PDM technician is going to be thrown into his or her job with very little training or experience. Uh, their bosses are going to have very high expectations of them. Right? Gee, we've gone out and we've invested a uh, you know fifteen or twenty thousand dollars in this technology and a little bit of training, and we expect lots of results. Well, uh, the plus side of this is those expectations should drive you <clears throat> to go out and show that return on investment, show that there is a business case for doing these things, right? Um, the plus side of it also is in, in, when we go out and we see people and say, gee, uh, we're just getting in, in started with uh, ultrasound in, in our company. Well, if you're just getting started, how many people have that training? If you're the person that's volunteering, and learning and going out and finding things and doing, you've kind of made yourself an, an important commodity now, haven't you? Right. And that's one of the things that, that I tell people is we ourselves are really responsible for our own success. Don't depend on somebody to just all of a sudden come by and tap you on the shoulder or tap you on the back of the head and say, well, this is our superstar, we're going to promote them. This is, you're the type of person, we need to be the, the people that, that, uh, that go out and show people why what we do is important, why what we do works, how what we do uh, improves the bottom line for our company. Uh, again, this change, it depends on you as a person. Do what you say you're going to do, right? If you're going to go out there and you're going to start doing air surveys, then, then put together a schedule and, and show people what you're doing and show them the results. Bring that data to support that need for change. Right? How much money are we spending on, on various things? Uh, compressed gases, for instance. Rally and reinforce your supporters. The people that, that are standing behind you and, and support what you do, make sure you're, you're letting them know you appreciate that, that you're thankful for the fact that you're given this opportunity. And then make sure that you publish every and all successes that you have, things that you've found with the technology. Gee, we found... Uh, arcing in corona in this particular electric room, in this particular panel. And had we not found that, there could have been an arc flash uh, situation somewhere down the road where somebody could have gotten hurt. So again, make sure you publish those things and make them visible. Some people aren't comfortable, you know, they'll say, people will tell me, you know, I'm not really comfortable with, with waving my own flag or uh, being somebody that's uh, is a self-promoter then promote the things that you're finding, right? Promote the technology. It's not really about, it doesn't have to be about promoting you. It can be about promote what we're learning, promote uh, the growth that we're having in this opportunity. So getting to the 10 things, right? Starting out level one is uh, attain that level one certification in the technology. Learning really is power. The more knowledge you have about a certain subject, uh, the more power you have in, in getting people to understand why we need it. Uh, certification, again, is a proof of knowledge. To have that certification shows people, yes, that this is somebody that's attended the training. Now either they attend it, they took a test, and they understand. Excuse me. 
they understand <clears throat> all the uh, information that goes along with that technology. Uh, that you understand the applications and setting of how to use that particular tool. Uh, that training and uh, certification is also going to help you eliminate mistakes because they're like any other technology, initially when you go out and start using it, you may have some false signals where you think, gee, I found something in particular here, when in reality you didn't have the device set up well and you may have picked up some other background uh, noise. <clears throat> Once again, and you're going to see this throughout this presentation, reinforce and publish those results. Right. Thank people for allowing you to be able to do this and then publish what's going on. Number two is walk down and identify. You can't just go out with this technology, and this is the mistake that I see some people make. Um, and by the way, Doug and I have our laughs over this when the two of us get together and, and, and we get talking about some of the things that we see out of client sites. Uh, one of my favorite stories that has to do with the, the UE, I've, I've, I've actually seen it two or three times now, is I'll go to a place and we'll start doing an RCM analysis and start, start talking about, well, if you're doing this particular maintenance test, do it using ultrasound, you could find out whether or not that uh, steam tree trap, for example, is uh, <clears throat> blowing through. And I'll have somebody say to me, well, we've got one of those, but it doesn't work, right? So I, I, I always say, well, when you get a chance, maybe a nice break or at lunch, you know, go grab it and bring it in here. Let me take a look at it. And uh, one particular case, uh, they hadn't even opened the equipment. The, uh, the packaging was still brand new, right? So they'd had it for five years and never really opened it and used it. The other two cases, it was a matter of they had not charged it. The batteries, one battery was completely dead. It wouldn't charge at all. <clears throat> Another one just needed to be recharged. But this has to become a regular part of your maintenance. You need to develop groups. There needs to be job plans in that says, we're going to send somebody out to go and test our steam traps. We're going to send somebody out on this particular floor of the building, and they're going to go out and, and test for air leaks or compressed gas leaks. We're going to send somebody out, and they're going to test for um, arcing and corona. <clears throat> to do this, one of the things that you may need to do up front is to make sure that you've got good equipment hierarchy that you can uh, organize these routes in. Um, if it's ISO 14224 compliant, that makes a, things a heck of a lot easier. I've been working with a couple of clients on that in the past two years, Honda being one, to say, Let's make sure we got good compliant hierarchy so when we set up our maintenance plans and, and let's say our, our routes for UE that uh, we know that somebody's charging time to and doing those routes. And we're getting information back that says, gee, we found an air leak here or <clears throat> these particular st steam traps were uh, identified as being blowing through. All right. So again, identify these employees components and inspect uh, everything, excuse me, identify components to inspect via the tool that matches component types or failure modes to the technology. So you really want your technology to go out there and address the failure modes that you actually see at your site. <clears throat> Building a business case for PDM is, is uh, the third thing that you can do. Uh, and this is, by the way, airborne ultrasound, I always tell people this is my favorite technology because when I go out and work with clients, and I love it when I get to a client that says, well, we're kind of dabbling with the technologies. We really aren't, uh, you know, using them. Uh, we, we have dabbled in, uh, let's say, air, airborne ultrasound and infrared, but we really don't have scheduled routes. And I say, how would you like a, a really good PDM program where you've got ultrasound, you've got infrared thermography, you've got vibration analysis, and uh, let's add in there uh, lubrication analysis. And they'll all go, well, we'd love to have that, but we don't have the money to get into it. I can tell you right now with just ultrasound, if you have a compressed air system, I can show you a way to use ultrasound and go out and do an assessment of the, that compressed air system and pay for the entire 
everything you need for a full-blown PDM program at your company just by looking at compressed air and compressed gases. All right, those leaks, defective steam traps, anything that you can do with uh, airborne ultrasound, you'll be able to build that business case and save enough money, typically within the first six months, to pay for all that other technology and the training that goes along with it. Again, when we go out and start doing this, you want to advertise those wins. Show that to your managers that will say, gee, we spent uh, $18,000 on the best piece of equipment that uh, UE Systems has, uh, and we went out and did <clears throat> our air leaks and our steam traps, and in the first six months, we saved uh, $200,000. And with that $200,000, now we've built a business case that says we want to go out, we want to invest in the other technologies. And with those technologies, we'll be able to save even more money. Right? Build that business case and show people what you're doing. <clears throat> As I just talked about the compressed air and gas surveys, um, this job is never done. That's the important piece to remember with this. Uh, some companies get into it, they do that initial survey, they, they save the, the type of money that I talked about um, within that first six months, and then they make the assumption, well, we fixed all our air leaks, they'll never come back. Well, that's not true. Uh, those leaks are going to come back, not maybe in the same place, but in other places. This is something that needs to become part of a regular routine inspection. Uh, we can be doing this with minimal resources once we get through that first round. Uh, I tell people the first time you do it, you're going to look at this and you're going to say, do we really have, uh, let's say, 750 air leaks over the, these two floors of the building? Yeah, you better believe that you do. The next time you do it, you're not going to see nearly as many, but there will be leaks. Uh, it'll probably be down in a neighborhood of, you know, 100 or less. But realistically, it's something that needs to be done floor by floor, area by area, or piece, one piece of equipment to the next. And the best way to do this and make sure it gets done, by the way, is you use uh, photos that, while you're out, uh, your, your person's out doing the rounds, have them take photographs of the areas where the leaks are, put a laser point or dot on them with the photograph so that when uh, the technician comes around to fix the leak that they can uh, know exactly where it's coming from. All right? Using ultrasound and lube, um, I, I teased Doug and Maureen because when I did this at the conference, I actually sang this because when I was putting the presentation together, I was being a little bit, you know, crafty, let's say. Um, it, it reminded me of the Madonna song, Get Into the Groove, but we're going to get into the lube today instead of getting into the groove. Um, train your lube technicians in ultrasound. This is a big deal. Uh, I just worked with a company in North Carolina where uh, I could not believe how much over lubrication was going on with, with their equipment. At least in the area that uh, we we're doing this RCM on, I would say that 80% of the bearings were over lubricated. Um, and so I got into instructing them on here's the proper way to lubricate. If we're using ultrasound along with lubrication, then we know ex when we got the exact right amount of grease in there. Um, we got to make sure people have the right equipment to do that job. There's a grease caddy that can do this. It makes things so much easier, and it also makes sure that we're getting the right and correct route of lubrication into that bearing. Uh, it's also going to help us to eliminate failure modes that we've seen over and over and over again because our lube technicians were not properly trained on what best practices were for lubrication. Moving on to number six. Enlighten your electrical group. Being somebody that came from the mechanical side of the business, I, I can honestly say that uh, the electricians that I worked at when I was with Eastman Kodak Company, uh, they were always, some of them, you know, really good at, at uh, confusing people when they talk about, gee, this switch failed open or this circuit's closed. And uh, I would love to pick on these guys on a daily basis about the little tools they carried in their, their toolboxes and in their pockets. Uh, 
But what really impressed me, and in fact scared the daylights out of me, is when they say, "Can you come up and help us in the switchgear room?" You know, we got a switchgear that we need to replace, and we need some people up there for safety purposes. And then you know, you look at this equipment with an IR camera, and you see these hot spots, and uh, this high voltage stuff scares the daylights out of me, right? Uh, and what I would encourage you all to take a look at if you've never seen this is look up arc flash and, and look at some of the videos that are online on arc flash incidents. This is one of the most important things that you can do with your ultrasound technology is to make sure that you have a safe environment for your people to be working in before they open a switch gear. Because we can hear things like arcing, tracking, and corona with that uh, airborne ultrasound technology and uh, make sure that uh, the cabinet is safe prior to opening it. So this is a, a great thing to do. Um, make sure that your your uh, ultrasound technician is squared away on what these things uh, noises sound like, so they're able to identify each of them. And uh, it's a great tool uh, to make your job and the job of the, your high voltage people much much safer. Um, I would not do high voltage work without this. Get involved with uh, root cause analysis and reliability center maintenance. Um, every RCM that I do, I would say that it's probably now less than 20% that we have a PDM technician in the room, and, and I really wish that I had one for almost 100% of the stuff that we worked on. Uh, Getting involved with these tools is going to make you a better uh, ultrasound technician because you'll understand and see and hear and learn about more failure modes. Uh, the folks at UE System will, will tell you, gee, we, you know, when they invented this technology years and years and years ago, uh, what they thought they could use it for is only a small portion of what it's used for today. Those other uses where they've expanded it comes from the technologists and the people out there actually using the equipment in the field to say, hey, do you know we, we tried using it on this and we were able to, to hear something and now all of a sudden we've got a new uh, use for the tool and that's another reason why it's important, by the way, to, to attend conferences and uh, do things like uh, these online presentations as we pick up new technologies all the time. Uh, or new failure modes all the time with, with different technologies. So uh, being involved in root cause analysis and RCM is going to help you understand and learn more about failure modes. Um, and those failure modes, which ones does uh, ultrasound apply to? Hey, Doug. Can, yes. Sorry. If you wouldn't mind popping back to that last slide, um, I just had a couple folks that um, were just looking for a little clarification around what you know a little bit more about what RCM is um, and RCA. Very good. Um, RCA is root cause analysis. Root cause analysis is a uh, reliability tool that's, that we use typically for investigative type purposes. We've just had a, a failure or an incident and we want to try to understand or determine what the cause of that was. In many cases uh, when we go out and do a root cause analysis and we say we think it was, uh, for example, this bearing, the reason why we had this uh, quarter million dollar gearbox fail is we think that uh, um, something caused the bearing to seize, right? And, or it could have been we put the wrong type of lubrication in the gearbox, or it could have been uh, we tried to start the piece of equipment when it was fully loaded uh, because we forgot to have the agitator going as, as we were filling it. And now we, so which one of those things was it? And the technology of ultrasound might be able to tell you, uh, gee, two out of those three things, the, that wasn't true because we took readings with this and we would have heard damage to the bearing prior to. Um, Reliability centered maintenance is very similar to root cause, only it looks like what looks at what could happen. So we'll take a, a major piece of equipment and look at it and say, what are the failures that could happen to this particular asset? And we'll take it component by component, looking at the entire system, 
and look at all the different ways it could fail. And in doing those analyses, we'll often say, is there a uh, uh, unconditioned task or a predictive technology that would detect that failure mode prior to the actual failing? So will it detect potential failures as opposed to uh, waiting for it to be all the way failed? And that's, that's where somebody having a technologist in the room really helps us out because they've got experience with uh, listening to and uh, trending some of this data. Does that answer it? I think so, but we'll see if uh, some more questions come in on that, but thanks. All right. Thank you, Maureen. Discovering new applications, and as I said, um, I think a little bit earlier, I talked somewhat about this. It really, we rely on, on our technicians and, and uh, Allied Reliability Group, the company that I work for, um, that's really our, our mainstay is our, is our PDM technologists that work out there in the field. We have a few hundred of them. And uh, each year we pick up new things with the technologies that we've been using, uh, airborne ultrasound, vibration analysis, oil analysis, um, infrared, and motor current analysis. We use those five things. And each year we add some new failures that they've discovered, our technicians, because they're out there and they're curious. They're saying, gee, I think we might be able to pick this up with this particular technology or a combination of those technologies. All right, good technicians follow the routes and they, and they have uh, their standard uses for the technologies. Great technicians do all those things and they experiment to find new applications and that's really what we like about uh, some of our better, better people or the guys that are out there that are saying, yeah, I'm not just going to do the, the 24 things that are listed on my route today. I'm going to do 24 things and I'm going to look for five or six other things that I can try the technology out on and do some trending and looking at this equipment over time to see if I can uh, discover some failures that maybe we've never considered. All right. uh, great companies, by the way, allow people to do that testing and to prove out. It's really a win-win for both the company and the technologist. So I often, you know, when I'm dealing with maintenance supervisors or maintenance managers, when they're talking about setting up a PDM program, I tell them, look, you really want to make that person because they'll say, well, we want to schedule them completely full of all the things that they can find uh, each day with the technology. And if we can't do that, then, then we'll have some time for them to work with their tools. And I'll say, uh, why don't you forget about working with your tools, schedule them about 80%, and then give them about 20% of their time to go out there and experiment and find some new things for you. That's really the ideal of uh, working with PDM, is to have that type of uh, view um, with how you're going to use your resources. Go out and um, achieve additional certifications. Uh, become at least level one certified in four technologies. The more you know about the different technologies, uh, the better technologist you're going to be uh, in, in UE, for example. If you understand vibration analysis, and you have achieved some certification, whether it's level one or level two, it's going to make, make you a better uh, technologist at ultrasound. Uh, the same thing goes for the other technologies. The more you know, uh, the better technician you're going to be at understanding when something is in the process of failing. So catching those potential failures and then being able to, to tell people, yeah, we need to do something about this. Uh, we need a, a put a job into the uh, queue to make sure that we address this because this is definitely uh, in the process of uh, failing because not only have we seen it and heard it with our ultrasound, but uh, we verified it with uh, vibration analysis or infrared thermography as well. So it's identifying those things that can be covered by PDM that's, that's really important and getting people to understand that business case for using PDM and crossing those technologies is what helps them to understand we can't just get by with one technology or two technologies. We really need a good sound base of four or five technologies to uh, have a good uh, and well-rounded maintenance PDM program.
right. Last but not least, uh, at number 10 here, sharing knowledge. Uh, I may have spoken early on, you know, as you get these instruments and you go out and you become certified, you have to make sure that people are aware of what you're doing. Um, walking around with your fancy new uh, UE gun and your headphones on and your hard hat and uh, not communicating with people, all they're going to do is wonder who's the, who's the fancy guy with the new instrument uh, and what are they doing out there walking around our site. You need to take the time to go out and talk with people and say, here's the technology, here's what we're doing. Um, hey, look, I found an air leak over here. Why don't you put these earphones on and you know, I'll press the trigger and then you can hang on the device, tell me whether or not you can, you can find that air leak, right? And then uh, give them an idea of what that air leak costs them. Take time to show people to build understanding of what they're doing. Um, write papers and articles about what you're doing. Uh, people want to learn more, and they also want to learn from, from those folks that are actually out in the field doing things. Um, so when you go out and you use your technology and you discover something, uh, make sure you put an article together about it or uh, write a paper or if you can even put together a presentation for a conference. Present your successes as well as your struggles. Right? Uh, it's not only important to tell people what went right, it's also important to tell them the things that went wrong. And lots of us are afraid to do that. Uh, and, and sometimes even our bosses get a little nervous when we start presenting at conferences and say, hey, we tried doing this and here's the, the, the few things that we messed up prior to actually having a success. Uh, and they'll say, why do we have to tell people about what we messed up? Because, you know, you don't want to see people go through the same struggles or troubles that you did. You don't go out and uh, make that transition smoother. Be active on, on sites like LinkedIn. Uh, where those of us that are in the community of maintenance and reliability are out there having discussions um, on, on the technologies, get involved in those things. There is a, uh, a group on LinkedIn for airborne ultrasound. I would encourage you to be involved in that and get involved in the, in the discussions that are going on. Learn and share actively. Uh, this is something that I, I try to do on a weekly basis. I have a blog that, that's up that uh, I think I have the address for on one of the last pages here. Uh, I'm constantly talking about things that I'm learning at, at different client sites, and I have a group of people that we uh, have conversations back and forth, other RCM folks. It's a great way to learn uh, is just by sharing. Uh, find a mentor or be a mentor, and I would encourage you to do both. There are people out there that you can learn from, uh, folks that uh, uh, attend conferences or, again, may have a blog or a discussion group. Find a mentor or be a mentor. There's also people that are new into the trades and new in the technologies, and they would love to have somebody that's got your level of experience to talk to where they can, they can say, here's somebody that's really out there doing this day-to-day -day like I am that I can learn from. All right, closing notes here before we get into some questions. And um, remember the change starts with and depends on you. Um, and it, as I talked about getting right into this presentation, no only means that you don't have a good enough business case. And I have been that person that's been told no several times in my career. It, it certainly, uh, didn't always stop me. There were times where, where it, it certainly uh, was enough of a pushback to go, gee, I'm not sure this is the right direction. But if you're confident in that direction, work at building a better business case and come back and change that no to a yes by showing we need to do this. This makes sense business-wise. Uh, success starts with and depends on good data and determined people. Lead by example. Go out there and show others that you work with how to build this business case. Reinforce the correct behaviors. People that are out there doing work and doing precision work and learning how to do things the right way, uh, especially when it comes down to 
uh, the use of technologies and, and lubrication. If there's one failure that I see more than any, it's uh, people messing up their lube programs because they haven't really done the training and they don't understand lubrication. Uh, we need to make sure people understand it and those that do understand it, we need to reinforce that they're doing it the right way. It, and that makes a big difference. Try to make work fun. Um, I can honestly tell you that uh, as far back as the Kodak days when, when I started there, the group of guys that I worked with in my first eight years, we still get, uh, get together uh, about once a summer and, and uh, have a, a party or a picnic at somebody's house and, and laugh about all the things that, that we used to do. And we got lots of work done and made some tremendous improvements to those areas that we worked in. Uh, it's a heck of a lot easier to go to your job when you can have a few laughs there every day. And then last but not least, ignore those excuses. You're going to hear those excuses from people. Some people um, just don't get it. And I'm one of those that says everything. everything's an excuse I'm just going to ignore. Right? We need to push forward. We need to get better. We need to learn more. And the great part about maintenance and predictive maintenance is this is a technology that continues to advance year after year after year. There's something new every year. Go out there and learn that thing and forget about those that, that are naysayers or have excuses. Um, this is the way to do business. And so Maureen, I press through before 45 minutes. What do you think of that? All right. That was good. Really good. Um, so we do have some questions coming in. And like I said at the beginning, um, you know, feel free to type those in, and we'll, we'll get as many as we can uh, answered here. Um, you see Doug's got up on his screen a couple websites to take a look at. And you know, he mentioned checking out the different blogs and things that are available um, within the reliability community. And I do think those are a really great tool um, because they're usually pretty pretty short and sweet and to the point with a little bit of kind of more creative side to it. So it's 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 a great way to learn um, about something without it being just always so technical and, and sometimes a little bit harder to understand. So I do love, uh, you know, with my morning coffee sitting down and going through some of the, the reliability blogs like Doug. So definitely check that out if you haven't had a chance to. Um, so with that, let's see what we got here, Doug. Um, one question that came through, it's got a couple different uh, layers to it, but um, here we go. So in your experience, do most places have dedicated PDM technicians or do most maintenance organizations try to train everyone to be proficient? Um, and then have you found um, if, a, if, a, if there's a particular background that makes someone a better PDM tech, like a mechanic, electrician, et cetera? So a couple different questions within one, but Hopefully you can. All right, I I have together. seen a mix of, of um, a couple things, I, and I will say that what I'm going to give you is what my belief is. I think my belief is to have dedicated people. Um, when you try to train everybody, you typically end up with um, a bunch of people that kind of half understand the technology. So I would encourage companies to go out and say we're going to have a PDM group and uh, those people will be dedicated to doing just uh, PDM type work. Uh, the second part of that question again, Maureen, was? Um, they were just wondering if there's particular backgrounds that make someone a better um, technician. So if you're, if you're planning on you know, finding a dedicated person, do you find that people with a mechanical background tend to be better, electrical, or obviously it probably depends on what applications yeah. they're going to be using it for, right? More than anything, I, I tell companies, you need to look for people that are self-starters, people that are, that are motivated to go out and use the technology to uh, find things, uh, report things. So people that are curious, right? Uh, people that are also somebody that you haven't got to worry about, you know, that they can set themselves to a schedule, perform those things, get those things done, and put together a good report. So uh, not particularly, uh, certainly I'm, I'm thinking about the trade aspect of that. You know, if you were looking for somebody to do vibration analysis, I would say you're going to look for somebody more on the mechanical side. 
when it comes to ultrasound, I don't think that's necessary. It's really more important that the person be a, a self-starter and, and somebody that's curious as to uh, the things that they can pick up or detect. Uh, so really, I would say vibration would be for mechanical people. Motor current analysis would probably be electrical people. Ultrasound really applies across all trades. Same thing with IR. It doesn't matter uh, what trade you are for, for those two. All right, great. Um, oh, they're, they're just flying in here now. Um, let me see here real quick. You'll love this one. Um, how do you select the assets on which predictive maintenance should be implemented? All assets or the critical ones? Well, you certainly want to want to start with critical ones on the on the on the get go. If you've done a good criticality analysis, and uh, that's kind of a loaded question when I ask people that, that they've done a good criticality analysis. What that means is that the the distribution of their data, uh, when you finish a good criticality analysis, appears to be random. It's not skewed. Uh, to one side or the other, and it doesn't show a normal distribution either. So that's one of the ways to check to make sure your criticality analysis that you did is good is that your data is uh, looks rather random. And to let's say you have a thousand assets, if we look at that all thousand assets and, and look at the criticality number, again that number should be random across your site as opposed to skewed left, skewed right, or normal. Uh, and in, in that case, if you've got a good criticality analysis, you would want to start with your most critical assets first with the PDM, but realistically, PDM applies across the board, right? We're going to do uh, and hope to have your all of your equipment being checked by the technologies. All right. Um, here's another one. Uh, government complexes don't have a bottom line or profit motive to make a business case with. How do you promote predictive maintenance at those facilities? All right, if there's no bottom line, then it comes down to cost. And I can tell you that uh, PDM is definitely a less costly uh, form of maintenance than preventive maintenance and far more. Uh, less expensive than run to failure strategy. So it really comes down to you're using that PDM program to detect potential failures and by potential, detecting potential failures you eliminate secondary damage. If they are disciplined enough to say, gee, we detected a potential failure, we now need to plan and schedule and replace that item before it fails and before secondary damage occurs. If we can do that, you should be able to lower your maintenance cost at least because reactive maintenance or, or run to failure maintenance is three to five times more expensive. So you should at least be able to lower your maintenance cost by a third if, you're, if you don't have PDM right now. And I'll add in, of course, the safety side of things is always important, right? Absolutely. <clears throat> All right. Here's someone um, wondering how what the best way to build a business case is, if um, and how to justify the cost of equipment, personnel, all the training that goes into it. If you don't have a history of a success with that technology at your facility, if you're just completely brand new to this whole world of of predictive maintenance. Um, here's the deal with that one. Uh, the the way you do it is go out and buy one instrument. And, and uh, of course, being the person I am, I'm going to tell you, go out and buy a UE uh, 15,000, Ultra Pro 15,000. Right? It's going to cost you fifteen to $18,000 to get the device. And if you've got a compressed air system I, and it, you have not been using the, the technologies, I guarantee you you're going to find enough money to have paid for that device plus the other technologies. It, it's, every time that I've told a customer that, it's worked out. Not once, you know, again, it's got to be a compressed air system that's running 24-7. If it's not running 24-7, then we got to look for uh, some other way 
but typically just with compressed air, you're going to save enough money to, to buy all those technologies. Uh, so the question would be, the only thing that would make that difficult is, again, if you're not running your compressed air system seven days a week, 24 hours a day, and that if you didn't have enough money or didn't have enough a person with a uh, high enough level of authority to sign for a uh, fifteen to twenty thousand dollar investment. Um, outside of that, then it comes down to uh, you would have to. If you couldn't get the device offhand, then you'd have to try finding those leaks by hand, and that that's going out and using the slip and water technique. And is uh, the folks that you even tell you you're going to have a struggle, but in doing that, you could certainly say, yeah, we have lots of air leaks, right? The nice part about having the device is it's going to quantify how much you are leaking. So uh, that's really the most effective way to do it is through ultrasound. And I promise we're not paying him to say all of this. Okay, so moving on. Uh, another one, wondering if you have a rule of thumb, so to speak, for the number of PDM techs to have. Um, for example, like does one PDM tech replace X amount of maintenance tradesmen? I would suspect that my boss, John Schultz, has some type of number like that, but I can tell you that uh, in the groups that I worked in, we were typically staffed, uh, and this is at Eastman Kodak Company, about 20% uh, PDM to uh, what I would call regular maintenance, which is going to involve your PM, your day-to-day -day maintenance, and your emergency demand maintenance, so all your planning schedules. So it would be about 20% uh, if you had a group of... Uh, of, of 10 people, two of them would be PDN technicians. All right. Um, someone was kind of interested to hear you mention using ultrasound for um, mechanical and lubrication um, applications. So maybe you can talk a little bit about some of the failure modes that you can detect with ultrasound in regards to uh, yeah, mechanical. The, um, there's two different ways here. Number one is, uh, you know, as I spoke to in that slide, is through the use of what um, is known as a grease caddy. That's grease-assisted ultrasound. And you hook that on, it looks just like a regular grease gun, but you've got a device on there that uh, as you're lubing it through the Zerk fitting, it's listening to the uh, um, noise from the bearing and it'll tell you when it has the correct amount of lubricant it'll it'll you'll hear noise up front then as you lubricate it it'll quiet down then you stop lubricating and typically wait for uh, a short amount of time come back put the device back on if it's still quiet you've got the right amount of lube in there if it gets noisy again try a little bit more all right if the noise doesn't go away then the bearing is the shot it's on its way out right so uh, the other thing is just contact UE with uh, uh, any of the other uh, devices, uh, ultrasonic devices that are out there, and you can listen to bearing noise frequencies and compare that, either use it alone as a technology to tell you whether or not the bearing is failing. By the way, it's, it's very effective uh, even at low speeds, uh, where sometimes folks with uh, vibration analysis struggle, um, but it's a good technology uh, for understanding when bearings are on their way out. They're going to get noisier. Um, the other thing with the technology uh, is on contact is um, in places where it's difficult to um, get a full revolution. Um, out of a bearing, and we see that time to time with robots and uh, other production equipment where the bearing is just uh, rotating back and forth, let's say maybe 180 degrees. If it doesn't get a complete revolution, the vibration analysis data is going to pre pretty much be useless, whereas the ultrasound will still pick up the noise uh, when the bearing is beginning um, to fail. All right, cool. And just as you were mentioning it, someone asked uh, if you can use ultrasound for uh, trending low-speed 
uh, bearings, so that was perfect. Um, and and actually, to that point, we just confirmed one of our speakers for our, our uh, 2015 Ultrasound World Conference is speaking specifically about how they've used um, ultrasound on their uh, slow speed bearings at their facility to, to great success. So just a reason for, uh, for that individual to come and, and check that out for sure. Um, so, well, I think we, we peppered you enough there, Doug, with a lot of questions. Um, I know some of you guys had some additional questions that were really super ultrasound specific, so I think the best course of action there is I'll get, uh, we'll get our UE folks um, to get with those individuals that had those questions so we don't put Doug on the spot too much with uh, too many specifics there. Um, and then some of the other questions that came in were more kind of housekeeping. So yes, we did record this session. And yes, it will be made available on our website. Um, so for those that got in a little late or had to drop off early, you'll definitely be able to, to catch this in its entirety um, here in just a, a, you know, a day or so. So no worries there. And um, Doug, there's also a couple folks that I'll put uh, directly in touch with you that had some more specific allied related questions. So uh, we'll get we'll get those over to you as well. But uh, thank you so much, Doug. I've got just a couple closing slides here, so I'm just going to take the screen back from you. Right, and thank you. Uh, yeah, that was really great. Um, obviously, it it uh, got us a lot of questions and. Um, stirred up some good conversations, so uh, we appreciate you taking the time out to, to share that with us. And I will mention that Doug has uh, agreed to be one of our keynote speakers at our uh, conferences next uh, spring. So you'll see a slide here on those dates Ooh. here in a second. But yeah, so we're excited. So imagine what Doug could do with, with 90 minutes of your time um, next uh, June. So. Uh, we thank you again for all of that. And uh, so just a reminder, if you go to uesystems.com, you can check out all of the different applications that you can use ultrasound for. So for those of you who are um, unaware of some of the things we can do, definitely take a look there, get in touch with us so we can you know, get out there and, and show you exactly how it's done. Um, but lots of great information, webinars, things like that, that you can find up on our website. Um, and of course, if there's something you can't find, just let us know and, and we'll dig it up for you. Um, as Doug mentioned, one of the great ways to um, kind of be successful and to, to really elevate yourself um, is to, to stay involved, you know, be involved in, in the LinkedIn groups, um, check out the different blogs that are around, you know, always be educating yourself, you know, so again, with these blogs, it's, it's just as simple as, you know, enjoying your cup of coffee and, and you can you can read through a bunch of them real quick. Um, but we do have two users groups on LinkedIn, our Ultra Probe users and our Reliable Asset World group. Great place to take some of the conversations that, that you guys were having uh, today um, you know, with the questions that you were asking. You know, take some of those questions over there. Get some feedback from your peers in the industry. Um, a few of you guys were talking back and forth on you know, the whole, when you're working at a government facility, what are those key uh, points to make, to arguments to make if, if cost isn't one of them. Um, I saw a few of you chiming in, you know, the, the Go Green initiatives and safety and things like that. So that's a, you know, those are great kinds of conversations to have over there on LinkedIn. So, so take advantage of that and, uh, you know, we can all learn together that way. So those are resources we've got available there. And uh, here's our uh, couple dates we've got. Our next uh, webinar is going to be on steam, trap, and valve testing using ultrasound. We figure it's getting into the fall. It's a good time to start talking steam. Uh, so we'll have Kelly Paffel with Swagelock Energy Advisors on October 28th from 1 to 2. So be looking for the invite for that if steam is of interest to you. Um, and then our conferences. So our second annual Reliable Asset World and our 11th annual Ultrasound World co-located in Clearwater Beach, Florida, June 2nd to 5, 2015. Great event. You get, you know, you register for one, you get access to both, kind of pick and choose which sessions you want to go to. Um, you can see lots of information about those on our websites. Um, so we hope that's something you can kind of save the dates and, and make a plan to, to come down and, and learn more about everything Doug was talking about today. Um, and of course, we've got our full 
you know, training calendars for our level one classes and, and all that good stuff up on our site as well. And with that, I will leave the contact info up there. So if you need to get in touch with us, you can. And I thank you guys for spending the day with us. And uh, we'll talk with you soon. Thanks.